I think we had a start full of action two minutes ago. I can beat this on nothing, nobody really get hurts, but yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Um, yeah, good morning. Um, thanks for coming to the first puppet camp here. Um, I don't want to steal your time. Just want to uh, say thanks to all the speakers for today. Thanks, for, thanks to Puppet Labs for supporting us. And then just um, handing over to James Turnbull. Thanks for coming over. Thanks for having the first keynote. And have a good <coughs> and a wonderful day. And tweet a lot. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm James Turnbull from Puppet Labs. I'm the VP of Technical Operations, which means I deal with most of the customer-facing side of the business. I wanted to start off to th uh, thank Burnt and the team at Netways who put on an amazing event. Um, well, hopefully, hopefully it'll be an amazing event, but I'm sure it will be. I went to some of the open source monitoring stuff yesterday and that was really good fun. I'm sorry I didn't come earlier to go to that actually, um, <laughs> as well. Um, so I'm gonna talk this morning a little bit about um, what I'm calling the state of the nation, which is a mix of two things. It's a little bit about where the Puppet, Puppet Labs is, where the Puppet Labs com community is, um, and a bit about technology, about what things that are in Puppet 3 and things we're looking to do in the future. And then uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Ralph, is going to finish up, talk a little bit about the Puppet certification program, which we launched at PuppetConf a couple of weeks ago. Uh, my email address and contact details are there. Um, I I'm relatively easy to find in the internet and a bunch of other places. Um, so where we were, so this is, um, this is as of the start of 2011. Um, the membership was a, you know, mailing list, mail list membership about 3,000 people. We had about 600 messages a month. We had about 400 people on the channel and, and <coughs> only had about 50 modules on the Forge. And the Forge was kind of crap at the time. Um, and this is where we are now. So in, in a year or so, or less than a year, we, we, we have, we've doubled the mailing list, doubled the number of messages, doubled the size of the people on the IRC channel, um, significantly added to the number of people on GitHub, and we have 500 modules on the Forge. Um, so we've had a lot happen. Um, and we've had a lot of uh, uh, the communities on the community growing. We've had a lot of development work and a lot of changes. Um, and in some respects, we're trying to deal with all of those changes currently. And so I'm going to talk about a little bit about what's next. <coughs> Firstly, one of the things we've done over the last 18 months or so has not been very good at communicating with you. Um, and that's because um, the organization also grew from about 200 to about 20 people to about 110 people in about 10, 12 months. Um, as a result, any organization that grows that fast, things can be a little bit dysfunctional. So we're going to get better about telling you what's happening. Um, and you'll see some more communication on this from the engineering team in the next couple of weeks. Um, make some more decisions in public. We're really interested in hearing, uh, particularly on the open source side of things, what you guys are interested in and what you guys are interested in being involved in. Uh, work together on the roadmap. And you'll see a bit of stuff coming out from uh, Deepak, who is uh, one of the directors of engineering who runs the platform team, who look after the Puppet Open Source Project about working together on roadmap and design. Um, and we're going to try and be open by default. And we've started to publish a bit more about what we define as being open. So um, for those of you aware, you know, a, a couple of years ago, we changed the license of Puppet from GPL to Apache. And the reason we did that was to allow a bunch of our partners to be able to integrate the tool. And it didn't necessarily make everyone happy. Um, but from our perspective, the, the growth of, of Puppet has, has expanded significantly in terms of the people we've partnered with since then. But one of the aspects of that is it's sometimes hard to work out what is open source about Puppet Labs and what isn't. So we make it really clear that by default, um, everything underneath, every th the platform itself, Puppet, Factor, Hero, all those things will always be open source. The things that, that Puppet Labs is going to make, uh, make uh, money off, the commercial applications we're going to make, are going to be things like dashboards and analytics, things that are, that are GUIs that most of our open source user base are not interested in using. But our Puppet Enterprise user base, who tend to be a bit more commercial and but no, no focus will be actually interested in. Before I get to that, one of the, re one of the reasons that, um, uh, one, one, of the, uh, one of the solutions to the problem of, of the fact we've not been hugely open um, is uh, our community management function has passed between about two, two different people and we've also been doing two or three other jobs at the same time. So I wanted to introduce uh, Dawn Foster. Dawn is up the back there. She's gonna stand up and wave. Dawn joined us two weeks ago, I think. Um, and uh, she actually started on the, the, the day before PuppetConf, or the first day of PuppetConf. So uh, she got dropped a little bit in the deep end. Um, Dawn joined us from Intel, um, where she was at uh, the Migo and Tizen um, community manager. She's got a long history of being a community manager and, and, a, and, a, and a strong background in community metrics. And you'll start to see a bit more of our metrics published. I think the first post went live on the website a couple of days ago, showing you our monthly community metrics. Um, 
And also she has, uh, she's published, even I think she published a book about community metrics as well. So that's, uh, that's worth a read if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, and she's going to spend the first month of her job sort of really coming to events like this, talking to members of the community, finding out what, what's wrong, things you want, want to change. So she's here all day. Um, come and bug her if there are things that bother you, um, pull requests that haven't been actioned, all of that sort of stuff. Um, but this gives us a really clear focus moving forward, uh, have someone who's actually, whose sole job is to look after the community. Um, and I want to talk a bit now about um, what we've done recently. Um, and this is going to focus quite strongly on, on, on most on the engineering side of things. Um, what's happened with Puppet 3.0, which came out um, uh, actually at PuppetConf, and what we have planned in the future. Um, one of the big things we've done is that uh, you see a look at, look, look, when you started to look at Puppet Manifest a few years ago, you started to see lots of really interesting things. And, and one of the really interesting things was lots of case statements with big long collections of clauses if this or case this or this piece of information um, and you ended up with what with I guess what you call a, a mix of logic and data <coughs> and one of the big things we've done um, uh, as part of Puppet 3.0 um, is we're actually trying to clean that up we're actually trying to say that there are two types of information in your Puppet manifest there's the actual data you know the IP address of this NTP server is you know, 1234 um, and then the bit you actually want to manage, like the, the, the logic itself, the, like the resources and things like that. We're going to try and separate those. And in order to do that, we've adopted a tool that um, Ari Panar, um, who wrote, wrote M Collective, also wrote called Hira, or Hira. Um, I'm not sure Americans pronounce it differently than I do. Um, so essentially, this is a way, it's a data lookup store. So it's essentially an a way of externalizing all of the data that you had previously put in, the IP addresses, um, the, the, the variables, externalizing that data away from your, away from your Puppet manifests. Um, and in order to do that, it, 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 um, in Puppet 3.0, it, it requires no changes to your manifests. Your, your variables will inherently look up here, um, and it's really yeah. easy to configure as a, as a backend. You can add things like um, t text files, CSV, JSON, YAML, all that sort of stuff to it. Um, Ruby 193, um, you notice a bunch of platforms uh, are moving to Ruby 193 as a default. Um, we sort of supported 193 for the last three or four releases, um, but some weird things broke. Um, as part of, as part of um, 3.0, it's actually a, a fully supported um, platform, and if anything breaks, it's, it's a legitimate bug we haven't seen, um, and we'll fix it. But um, from now on, you should be able to move forward with 193, which provides a little bit of performance enhancement over 187. Um, and there's a bunch of bugs in that were in 187 uh, and earlier that are fixed as in 193. Um, the Puppet module tool and the image here, is some of you uh, uh, may know Kelsey Hightower, who wrote most of the original Puppet module tool stuff. Uh, he, um, he called the project Geordie LaForge. Those of you who are staff for Trek references will recognize the background. Um, Kelsey was our, at the t uh, is, is our sole African-American employee, so he gets away with making the joke. Um, so. Uh, Puppet module tool ships with 3.0, so at the moment the Puppet module tool is really good at, at, at building modules, pulling modules down from the forge. It's not really good at the thing that, that we actually wish it was, which is actually publishing modules, and I'll get to talk a bit about, um, uh, about what's happening there. Um, so th what's sh shipped to 3.0 allows you to browse the module forge, which is, which is now a bit more interesting because it has 500 modules in it as opposed to 50. It allows you to build modules, um, but you still have to manually upload. But um, as of Monday week, I believe is the, the date, is Ken Barber somewhere around? He's not here, okay, oh, there he is. Uh, um, a, as of Monday week, um, as of not next Monday, but the Monday after, we'll be releasing a new version of the Forge, um, and it will have a publishing API, um, and the Puppet Module tool will be updated sometime after that to support that API, which means from the command line, you'll be able to build your module and then publish it to the Forge, um, which should make it considerably easier. Um, some of you may know Chris Bayart, who works at Intuits in Belgium. Chris has been nagging me for the last 12 months about how stupid the Forge is and, uh, and why can't I publish my modules. And I would publish my modules if, uh, if you uh, just had a decent API. So we're now going to have a decent API. And Ken will be talking a bit later about some of that, possibly, maybe. OK, but um, you can bug him about the API. Um, and, it, and you can get a, a bit of a preview of what it's going to be like. Um, as part of that, also, the Forge is going to be significantly enhanced. Currently, it's very hard to tell what's a good module. Um, so you can look on the Forge, and there's five modules that manage Apache. So which one do I choose? Uh, uh, it's hard to tell what operating system they support. It's hard to tell whether anyone's ever downloaded that one or whether they've rated it. So some of the things we're going to be doing is um, uh, better rating systems, better indications of what supports things. So you'll be able to make actual make, be able to make determinations. OK, well, this module only supports Ubuntu. I'm going to choose the one that supports CentOS as well as uh, Ubuntu and Debian. 
Um, and together with that, um, there'll be a significant enhancement of the way um, the module forge actually actually um, actually looks. It's kind of it's kind of an ugly Rails application right now. It's going to be a much much prettier application with actual people who design websites for a living to building it instead of sysadmins like me. Um, so mo lots of cool stuff there. Um, variable scope. This is another hated topic in the public community. Uh, dynamic scoping is going to go away. Um, it was a stupid idea. We're really sorry. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it's embarrassing, but it's it, 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 at least it's going to get fixed. So variable scoping will now be really simple. It'll be local variables first, then inherited, then node variables, then global variables. It'll be really simple, um, and it'll tell you exactly when you, when you have not defined something in the right place. Uh, it won't give you a creepy weird error saying, you know, blah, 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 you know, is not there. It'll say that, you know, it can't look up the scope of this, this variable in this particular scope, um, which should remove a significant number of problems people have um, building puppet manifests and having them behave in strange ways. So some of you may have seen some graphs we put out around the Puppet 3.0 release. Um, we use Puppet internally to manage all of our systems. Um, and when we upgraded the internal Puppet Masters to 3.0, uh, one of my colleagues said, um, there's something weird with the graph. And I went, which graph? And he goes, the, the Puppet CPU usage. And I went, what, what do you mean weird? And he said, well, after the first runs we did after we installed Puppet 3.0, the graph looks like it's fallen off a cliff. And I went, oh, okay, that's pretty cool. Um, and he printed out the graph out. And between 30 and 40 percent increase in performance, um, and that's that's I reckon for a, for a, for a release that's pretty impressive. Considering that that puppet's performance on occasion has sucked really badly, um, 30 to 40 percent, um, we we were we were really impressed by the fact that it, less CPU, less memory, runs are much faster, um, and this is basically uh, some of you may know Daniel Pittman, who's one of our developers. Daniel basically spent three weeks in the guts of Puppet, going, "Oh my God, why did Luke do that? He's an idiot." And, and fixing all of that code. Um, as a result, um, there's some significant sort of improvements. This is part of an overall sort of performance improvement strategy, and we're doing a lot more performance testing in the next few months. Um, and the idea is really to rip the guts out of a lot of subsystems that have never been touched in quite a long time and improve the performance. Um, as part of that, we'll probably be looking at a few different things. Um, there's, a, there's been a long-standing argument in the community that, that, that Ruby is not necessarily the best tool to have written Puppet in. Yeah, um, I, I like Ruby, but yes, there's probably some, some some elements of that, and we may look at things like the Puppet client may end up being written in a in a different language. So um, people have tossed up sort of Scala or Erlang and all sorts of alternatives. Probably more likely to be something like C or something like that, where it's actually a small, really fast, um, a really fast little simple agent that doesn't do very much because effectively the agent doesn't really do very much. It really gen really takes the, the catalog, processes the resources, and, and sends a report. That's not a complicated bit of functionality. Um, in fact, Ken Barber, who was here earlier, has a prototype version of, of, of that client. Is that public, that repo, or not? The C client thing for, is that, is that a public repo? Okay, all right, well, it didn't work, but uh, th th there's, there's some lots of, there's moves to do that anyway. Um, one of the other big gripes about, about um, uh, Puppet, particularly if you use environments, is that um, it, it was really great um, that clients could set the environment, except when it wasn't. Um, that was usually for things like, oh my God, somebody has decided to set the client from pre-production to production, and all of a sudden one of your pre-production hosts became into production, because you couldn't control it from the, or you couldn't guarantee from the master that it was going to be set to a particular environment. So we consider that a bug. Uh, it took us a couple of years to fix it, um, mainly because it probably took us a couple of years to work out what the hell happened. Um, but it's been, it's been fixed, and now the master is definitive, the definitive source for setting your environment. So from a security perspective, Someone can no longer get onto your system and change the environment, um, and you can be ensured that from the master you actually get this, the right client, the right environment. <coughs> Whoops. I think it's gone too far. And now it doesn't want to go back. Huh. Um, some, of, some of you may also be familiar with the fact that plug-in sync um, was never, never a... Uh, there were unpredictable things about plug-in sync. Um, and it's not exactly a great system. It tends to plug in sync things to the master and the client when it probably should only send them to the master, like functions and reports. Um, it wasn't very good um, when it came to uh, identifying what was a thing you should load into, into, into a as a library as, as Ruby and what was a plugin that should be used in Puppet. Um, it tended to fail on the first run, so you could only, you know, you, you plug in sync something and then it took two runs before that plug in sync thing was available. Um, that's all been fixed in 3.0. So now if you uh, load a, things like something like a report processor or a fact or a function, you can use that on the run it's actually loaded in, um, which, which is a significant enhancement in the way plug-in sync worked. 
Um, there's a few DSL polish things. We've added the, the unless to the language. Um, keywords as resource parameters and properties. Fix the number of parser bugs. Uh, we're really sorry about introducing dashes. That's my fault entirely. I thought it was a good idea. I was clearly wrong. Um, and uh, we, we, as a result, there's a couple of releases in the 2.7 series where um, the, the regex that looks at variable names is a little bit not, is not greedy enough um, and it tends to uh, ignore everything after the dash. Yeah, I fucked that one up. Um, there's more of this coming. Um, we've now got someone who actually creates the cu curates the language. We've actually got a, a UX designer whose job it is to look at the language and go, well, that was a stupid idea. We should do it better. Um, and if you have input you want to do to that, then, I mean, log tickets now because it's a, a good opportunity to say, you know, we want to make this a, the language a bit more sane. Um, as part of that, um, some of you may have seen we did a Google Summer of Code project that involved completely rewriting the Ruby DSL. So there's now a, a, an actually reasonably fully functional Ruby DSL, which hopefully will get merged in the next couple of months. Um, there's a bunch of fixes that need to be made to, it, to the, the code the, the student produced. But um, if you, you want to write your puppet manifest in Ruby, this makes it actually, it provides the full scope of functionality, whereas the previous Ruby DSL was a little bit limited. So um, some of you may see the change log for Puppet 3.0. There were a lot of bugs fixed. A significant amount of code cleanup, performance enhancement, um, and a significant um, what, what, what the engineers call correctness fixes, which is also known as Luke's code sucks. Um, and uh, mo most of those aren't visible to you, but the, fa the fact that this sets us up to actually build a, a, a much stronger platform than what we had previously. So what shipped? Uh, Puppet 3.0, Factor 2.0, and Hero 1. Um, uh, Hero is, is obviously integrated with Puppet 3. Factor 2.0 um, uh, shipped. Um, it's not quite what we want it to be, and I'll talk a little bit about what we actually want it to be and where it went wrong. So one of the things you may have noticed um, over the last few years, and, and this is sort of Luke's problem and sort of my fault, um, was that Puppet versioning was always a bit strange. So when I first got involved in the project, uh, we, we had you know 0 0.24 was the first, or 2.3 was one of the first releases I worked on. Um, when we actually sort of looked at, um, at, at you know, incrementing releases, we, I think the first 025 release was the first thing where we started to remove XML RPC and replace it with REST APIs. <laughs> Sadly, um, instead of going, that probably is 0.5 of a re release, in, we considered, oh, that was 025, and then we would 0251 and 2 and 3, and they were significant feature releases. Um, but the version number didn't re represent that at all. Um, so what we've moved to is that we moved to semantic versioning um, so that you uh, really simply understand what, you know, uh, for a semantic version, what, what, actually what it actually means is that a major release, so the three dot part of the release, means that this has breaking changes from two dot. Um, and in the past, it was somewhat unpredictable. You could go between 2.6 and 2.7 um, and not be really sure what was API compa was compatible. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. We make a pretty much a guarantee to say that if you use two point something, and you move to three point something, there will be things that break. You will have to, f to look at your manifests. Most of the time that we will, we, uh, um, uh, most of the time we're gonna provide really good deprecation warnings. You're gonna see there's a bunch of deprecation warnings in three when you run it against 2.7 manifests. Minor versions will be compatible with new features. So 3.1 will be new features, but it will be completely compatible, backwards compatible with 3.0. Um, and uh, for those of you who think that's something that's unusual, for the Puppet community, this will be a new and exciting difference. Um, and lastly, the, f the final thing is the patch version. So just be bug fixtures with no behavioral functional changes, uh, as opposed to the current model, which is not so great. Um, so that's something the engineering team has, has committed to, and you'll see that across all of our applications moving forward. We'll move to that semantic versioning. Uh, version numbers mean match the way we write and ship code, and you can be scope confident about the scope of changes in any release. So one of the things that we're trying to do better is ship code faster, and you've probably seen that, that a number of the release candidates and a number of the products get more released on a more scheduled basis. Um, and we want to provide a OS packages for release candidates. So obviously when we've just provided tarballs in the past, it's a pain in the ass to have to, to actually build stuff from that. So we're going to start providing um, DEBs and RPMs, uh, and maybe GEMs as well. I think GEM versioning is not very good with, um, with uh, release candidate code. Um, but we're going to provide those so that it's easy for you to be able to upgrade and test your environment. Um, so you, th we saw that with the 3.0 release. There were, there were OS packages available for all of those, and they'll be put in, in our uh, package repos. Um, there's some discussion how we're going to handle those package repos, but we'll, um, if you have ideas about how that can work, um, 
And please uh, let uh, the release team, which is Michael Stonkey, uh, know. Uh, monthly development releases. Um, so Waldorf is the code name for the next major release after Telly. Um, I think Waldorf will be four point something, but um, uh, uh, engineering will make that determination. Um, we'll ship a tested version every month as a preview. Um, and that way, you know, you don't have what we had with Telly, which was between 2.7 and 3. There was about a 8 to 10 month gap. Um, and you get a, be able to have an opportunity to try things out. And plus, we'll, we'll also ship uh, open source packages. So you'll see some stuff on the mailing list in the next few weeks from Deepak, uh, Andy Parker, who run, runs the platform team from an engineering perspective. Um, we'll, we'll actually start publishing some of this information. Things that are not done yet or we didn't get to. Um, we wish we'd fix parameterized classes. When we first introduced it, it was a really nice idea. Unfortunately, it didn't work everywhere. Um, and uh, I would go, you should use this. And someone would go, no, you, no, you shouldn't. It's broken. And I'd be like, no, it isn't. Oh, yes, it is, um, which, is which is always fairly disappointing. Um, we haven't fixed all of the bugs yet. We've fixed a significant number of them. Uh, hopefully, in one of the next um, releases, you'll find that parameterized classes work everywhere and it's all sane. Uh, undef versus nil, this is another one that's really weird. Puppet variables, um, if you leave them undefined, Sometimes they're nil and sometimes they're not. Um, and uh, that's not great. Uh, classes with the dash in the name, again, my fault. Um, we're going to fix that too. Um, you may have seen an email recently. Um, we've decided to deprecate the dashboard. The dashboard um, was built uh, in the very early stages when I worked at Puppet Labs. It was built by a bunch of Rails developers, um, which meant that it's somewhat more elegant than most of our web, app web properties, but it's still not great. Um, it's built on Rails 2.0. Um, and it was never particularly, it never particularly was something that gelled with us as, uh, as um, people in the community didn't really like it. Um, I must admit, if I, if I had to choose between the, the old dashboard and Foreman, I probably would have chosen Foreman. Um, and I think oh, had Levy's done an awesome job of building that. So we're going to get rid of the dashboard um, and we're going to replace it with two, two open source tools. The first one is the parts of the, the dashboard that did node classification, the ENC stuff. Um, we're going to build a service, an API-driven service, uh, with a very, very simple front end, uh, and that will allow you to do node classification. So um, that's a big step forward for us. Um, having an API-driven service to classify your nodes will make things significantly easier to build integrations and significantly easier to use. Uh, and the reporting portion of, of, the, uh, of the dashboard, we're going to replace with, a pu with uh, we're going to move reports into PuppetDB, which we released uh, earlier in the year. Um, and we're going to provide a simple graphical interface on top of, on top of the Puppet DB API. Um, and that'll entirely be API driven. So if you want to build your own interface, uh, OHEAD will be able to take update Foreman to, to, to use that API. Uh, and, and it'll be relatively sort of simple interface. Uh, Puppet Labs will probably build a number of commercial applications on top of both of those. Um, and there'll be things like you know, more sophisticated analytics or advanced reporting, things that most of our open source unit users either build for themselves or aren't particularly interested in. Um, Puppet Labs modules needed more attention. You might have seen there's a flurry of bug fixes last night. There was a bunch of guys in the office in Portland who, who fixed a bunch of our modules. We've started shipping a bunch more modules. Um, the operations team, our internal operations team, shipped about 10 modules in the last couple of months to, to our Puppet Labs dash operations space. Um, and you'll see that, that a, a bunch of the modules have been improved. Uh, I think even VCS repo, which is a horrible, horrible hack, um, got, got improved uh, a, a bit and actually works a bit better than what it does. So you're going to see a bit more investment in that and you can see a bit more of those modules being moving towards what we'd say is like a blessed module. Like a Puppet Labs, you know, thinks this module is really good and we will support it if it doesn't work. Um, and that should make it easier to choose some modules on the forge. Things that we didn't get rid of um, or, de or rather were delayed. Um, we had intended in 3.0 to get rid of the import function. Those of you who still use import don't. It's a performance hog. It's a pain in the ass and it's not very much fun. Um, use modules. Auto loading works really well. It's really fast. If you use import, you have with F stats everywhere in your fucking file system, and it's awful. Um, so this this way, what we actually prevent um, moving removing import entirely will probably be the 4.0 release at this rate. Um, but it will be deprecated sometime in the three release. You'll get a warning saying, you know, please remove your import statements. Um, some of you may know what the static compiler is. The static compiler currently, the ca when the Puppet builds its catalog. Um, you know, it it's builds the, the catalog and ships to the client, and the client makes a number of calls. HTTP gets ba back to the, the master to say, get me this file, or get me, the, 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 get me the, um, this particular object. The static compiler essentially produces a, um, uh, a much simpler catalog where there are most of that information is shipped with the catalog. Instead of having to make multiple calls back and forth to the, the Puppet master, you'll get things like, this is, the, this is the right hash for the, for the objects that shipped. 
um, and it significantly reduces the, the amount of network traffic between the master and the client. We were going to make that the default in 3.0, and we didn't, um, and uh, that'll probably be in the, in the 4.0 release as well. Uh, the last one is something I've been griping about for a long time. Factor only produces variables that are strings, um, even though they look like things that shouldn't be strings, like numbers. Um, uh, arrays and hashes are kind of a, uh, kind of a pain. Um, you know, you, you're, uh, you essentially have to manipulate those in, in the puppet manifest itself. Uh, so we're going to replace that entirely um, with typed and structured facts. So it'll probably be a JSON-style-esque output. Um, and that's something we had hoped to do in Factor 2.0, but probably we'll have to wait till Factor 3. Um, and the reason for that um, is that uh, using Puppet, using Factor Facts inside Puppet is a reasonably complex sort of entity at the moment. Um, and we didn't want to break significant parts of Puppet um, without being able to, we, you know, we wanted to, unlike parameterized classes, we wanted to actually work out of the box first time. So there's a bunch of fixes that needed to make it in Puppet first, and most of those are, are, are sort of either done or on the way, and after that we'll be able to ship proper structured and typed facts. And essentially this is one of the part of the new promises. On release, new features should actually work the way we promised they work. Um, new and exciting concept. Um, so next challenges after the engineering team uh, is walled off, um, and then kicking ass and taking names as they call it. Um, schedule transparency, so actually giving you an indication of what's coming and what's in it. Uh, Redmine accepted tickets. This is essentially, we're treating this as a scrum unsorted product backlog. Um, we are moving the model, we are moving the model forward so that if you vote for a ticket, that's be, that will be what the engineering team uses to make a determination about fixing that ticket. So if you have tickets that have been outstanding, haven't got any action, vote for them, get your friends to vote for them, get your mum to vote for them. Um, and, and that will be the, the thing that, that when they sort the product backlog, that, that will be the things they actually pay attention to. That'll be the things that, that they say, Somebody actually cares about this. There's a lot of bugs in the Puppet, in the, in the Redmine instance for Puppet. Um, probably a lot of them are stale um, and, and, and aren't things we, we're going to fix, but things you actually care about, please vote for. Um, in Redmine, a target version means that uh, of 3.x or, or whatever the thing means, that we might fix this before 4.0. So it's probably going to be a, uh, minor features and bugs, things that are not backwards compatibility broken. Um, target. Uh, Target open tickets the next numeric release mean to try to means it trying to fix that release. We're still shipping time-based products, so every time we get to an end of a month or the end of the sprint, there will be a, 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 a line drawn in the sand and a release will be cut. Um, and that means that some things will miss that, that date, and, but we will try and actually keep those up to date so that if it has a target version in there, that actually is a promise as opposed to sort of a, when I did it, it was sort of a wild-ass guess. <coughs> Other experiments. Um, you'll see... Uh, there's some int discussion internally recently about expanding the number of committers for the Puppet project. Um, we've not been very good at that. We've not been very good at building community around, uh, uh, development community around there. And part of that's because our, our community is largely sysadmins and you're all busy people um, and committing code to a project is, is a non-trivial exercise for you guys. Um, whereas developers, you know, that, that, that's not a break in their routine. Um, so uh, we we're actually going to have some communication on the main list over the next few weeks about um, how we're going to uh, build the governance model for Puppet and allow people to actually, a few more people to actually commit to the project. Um, and if you are interested in becoming a committer, come talk to me, um, talk to the engineering team or, or, or use the Puppet dev list. And what we're going to do is, is we're going to sort of try a couple of different experiments as governance models. Um, and if you have ideas about how that should work or you work on other projects where, where that works better, please let us know and we'll see if we can, if we can try and make it all work. This is all fairly speculative. The engineering team made me promise that I wasn't going to make any promises. Um, so the static compiler, um, content references, not URIs, um, a single file catalog, an easier push model. Um, these are a few things that, that, are, that are sort of being talked about. And if you're interested in any of these specifically, it's worth pinging the engineering team on the Puppet dev list and, or on IRC and asking about the you know, specific uh, components or if you have things you would like, design aspects of this, then now's the time to speak up. Structured facts, I uh, said so JSON is the, is the template for that. Um, third party facts only initially, so we'll only look at, um, uh, it'll be the stuff that we, um, that we ship as part of the core, it won't actually do, you know, it, it will have backwards compatibility for, for things that are, sh are shipped externally. Um, better graph processing, um, we're gonna prove the graph handling. Some of you may be familiar with the anchor pattern. Um, it's, a, it, it, it's, a, it's a horrible hack um, that Dan, I think Dan Bodie came up with. Um, 
and we're going to actually fix that so that, that, that the, the, the how, how we structure the ordering of things is a bit more clear. Um, those of you who don't know, in 2.70, um, there used to be a complaint that, that Puppet resources were sort of randomly ordered per, per, per run. So anything that didn't have a relationship between it, resources that weren't connected by some sort of metaparameter, uh, would happen in, a, in whatever order they happen to be sorted to. In 2.7, we changed that so that after your relationships are calculated in the graph, everything else runs, the resources run in the same order every single time, which means you'll never get any surprises about, about that. If, it, if it's broken, it'll be broken every single time. It won't randomly change and therefore potentially you know, create a, a, a new problem. Improvements to performance and logic. Um, and this is really designed to, so currently pu Puppet is a very node-centric tool, so you configure you know, a, a node at a time, but ultimately you don't really care about your nodes, you care about the services that run on those nodes. And uh, if you want to do proper things like cross-node orchestration and look at services uh, made up of whole groups of nodes, we need to improve the graph to be able to do things like what happens when you build a relationship between this graph and another graph, so two nodes and their relationship. And a lot of this sort of work is designed to be able to make that easier. And you'll see over the next 12 months we'll be releasing some tools that take advantage of that, um, both from, a, from a, a management perspective, tool, you know, integration with things like mCollective to do orchestration, and also things like visualizations. Uh, I think uh, Deepak had a very good demonstration in PuppetConf, which shows you a Puppet DB visualization of, of, um, of uh, a, a number of catalogs. Um, he did a lava lamp sort of demo, I think. I think that's available on one of the videos. Um, but it'll be a number of things like that allow you to do things like, here's the graph of my, my, my node, what happens if I take this resource away? What, what resources are impacted? And then we look at that over a larger scale, over a series of nodes. What happens if I poke this one node? What's the effect across my whole environment? And that allows you to do a lot of things like, uh, uh, like sort of like a global no-op mode is to be able to say what happens if I you know if I change my Apache resource you know the flow on impact across all my web clusters here's the flow on impact to my load balancer and allow you to do some some real-time um, sort of change management planning better environments one of the things we can't do yet is that different versions of a type or provider are, aren't possible in different environments which makes it very hard to plan forward um, and we'll be getting we'll be uh, fixing that particular problem um, it's not an easy problem to fix um, but we'll hopefully allow you to do things like having a different version of a type in, in staging and production and, and so on and so forth. Cleaner documented code. Um, that when Daniel Pittman started in, in engineering, one of the, his biggest complaints was that it's very hard to use Puppet as a library. So Puppet's API is, is not 100% clear if you're building a type or a provider. It's not an easy thing to understand. So we're going to make that um, a lot cleaner. And we're going to refactor a bunch of those interfaces. So if you are building types of providers, it's fairly consistent, it's fairly simple. Um, and there will be some really solid examples to be able to build your own integrations on top of. So um, that's all I had to say. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ralph, who I haven't given very much time at all, but um, uh, he's going to talk a bit about education and certification. Thank you, James. <coughs> Einen schönen guten Morgen. Morgen. Ja, in Düsseldorf sagt man auch Moin, Moin. Thank you, James, for, uh, for the introduction. And my name is Ralph Lux. I'm the technical training director at Puppet Labs. And uh, I do come from Düsseldorf originally, though I've been living in the United States for longer than I care to admit. So, um, which button? Ah, good. Good to know. So I'm here to talk about our new certification program uh, that we have just launched at PuppetConf. Who here has heard about Puppet Con certification? A few of you? Awesome, awesome, good job. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit more about it, what it is, what we have in it, and how you can become certified. So why, why would you care about Puppet certification? Because there is a space in where we all say, here we are going to be successful, and that that space sometimes is a little undefined. Puppet certification helps you define that space by knowing what are the skills that are required to be successful with Puppet and by showing that you have those skills and you, can ha you have proven that you have those skills, which is good for employers because they can now look for people that are Puppet certified. It's good for you because you can now say, I'm Puppet certified. When I started with Puppet, uh, a little while ago, we looked at creating a curriculum and a certification path. And we have done that now with the release of the Puppet Fundamentals course. 
that um, has, is, is rolling out worldwide as we speak. And we have done it with the creation of two certifications built on top of that. One, a puppet professional certification for administrators, and another one, a, a, a puppet developer certification for developers who want to extend Puppet beyond that. We are still working on the very last step, the level 400 there, which is going to be a hands-on certification for somebody who's, who wants to show that they know not only administration but also development and can take Puppet to the next level. So what do we have we launched? We've launched a Puppet Professional Certification. It's uh, based on an exam of 60 questions, system administration using Puppet. Um, you get 90 minutes to, to, to take it. It is available at all Pearson View testing centers. There's about 5,000 of them worldwide, including several here in Germany. And um, it, it, it costs $200 to take the exam. If you fa pass the exam, then you are puppet certified. You are a puppet certified puppet professional. You get a certificate. You get some logos that you can add to your business card. The tests on Puppet Open Source 2.712 or later, we've tried very hard to make the questions not version specific, but technology specific. Um, and it also does test on Puppet Enterprise 2.5. So a lot of people are asking, why do I need to know Puppet Enterprise if I only want to work on Puppet Open Source? The answer to that is that we have one certification and it checks for knowledge of all of our products. However, um, it, you do not have to purchase Puppet Enterprise first to, to uh, in fact, become knowledgeable. It, the, the question percentage is less than 20% on Puppet Enterprise, and you can, a lot of people we've talked to said that they downloaded the, the free version of Puppet Enterprise, evaluated it, and that gave them enough to, to pass the test on those questions. Um, and obviously, we want to make sure that if, if you hire somebody or if you say you're Puppet certified, that you understand all of our products. Puppet Developer is a exam that is currently in beta, which means that um, it is not completely finished yet. We are waiting for inputs for from people like yourselves to take the exam and actually tell us which questions are good and which questions are not good. So that comes with a good side and a bad side. The, the, the good side is that while the exam is in beta, it is free of charge. If you send an email to me or to certification at puppet.com, we will send you a voucher code so you can take the exam and register for it without having to pay for it. That's the good side. The bad side is that an, instead of 60 questions, it's 195 questions. <coughs> instead of two hours, uh, we give you four and a half hours to complete the exam. The reason for that is, is that, we uh, that we ask you for each question to give us a few comments so that once we have 100 people who have taken the exam, we can go to then make an evaluation on which questions we want to keep. <coughs> we fully intend on uh, throwing away about 75 of those questions. We just don't know which 75 yet. That's what we need you to tell us. Okay. Um, so I, uh, if I have one request today, it is that uh, if you have at all interest in puppet development and uh, be being a certified puppet developer, um, write to me, get the voucher code, go ahead and register and take the exam. Once we have 100 uh, people taking the exams, we'll be in a much better position to say this is a valid exam that, that we can evaluate people against. Again, it tests on open source and on Puppet Enterprise, but as you would expect for a developer uh, exam, the percentage of enterprise-specific questions is significantly lower than on the administrator exam. So what do you need to do to prepare for exams? The only requirement that we have for exams is hands-on experience. So if you want to become certified in Puppet, we require that you work with Puppet. Mm. All right. So that's the only thing that, that is a requirement, either with just the Puppet software for the Puppet Professional or with development with Ruby if you want to be a Puppet developer. We do have some recommendations. Uh, obviously, as the education director, I would very much appreciate it if you took our training courses, and those training courses are written to help prepare you for the exam. However, it's not a requirement, and in fact, only taking the course is not going to be sufficient to prepare you for the exam. You have to take the course and have hands-on experience. There are some other things that are available. We have free practice exams available on our website that you can take to give you uh, 20 questions. They're going to give you a feel for what 
type of questions to expect on the exam. We have a documentation available for uh, Puppet Enterprise user, the user's guide for 2.5. We have a virtual machine file available on our website that you can download to test and try your hand at, at using Puppet, even if you don't have machines that you want to manage with Puppet yet, or if you don't necessarily want to try your knowledge on your production environment. Um, we also have two books, um, one of which is Puppet, uh, Pro Puppet, and it's written by um, our, our own James Turnbull and Jeff McCune. And the other one is a book that is about to come out and will be available called Puppet Types and Providers. It's written by Dan Bodie and Nan Liu, and uh, we recommend that for the developer exam. And then uh, last but certainly not least, there we have a whole website, uh, puppetlabs.com services certification, that has links to all of those resources, including the practice exams and to registration for the exam. Any questions on certification or what to do to prepare for it? Again, my request for all of you is if you are interested uh, in the Puppet Developer Certification, please help us create a really good certification by taking the beta exam and then uh, giving us your feedback on what, what are good questions and what are not. Once you are certified, here's what success looks like. You'll get a beautifully handcrafted certificate. <laughs> More importantly, you get the privilege to brag and call yourself a Puppet Certified Professional or a Puppet Certified Developer. Um, and you're on your way to becoming a Certified Puppet Master, which will be the final certification in the end. And just always remember that if you think that training somebody and then seeing them leave is a bad thing, it's even worse if you don't train them and they stay with you. Thank you. Um, I probably have to have, haven't left a huge amount of time for questions, but if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to jump in quickly now, or I'll be here during the rest of the day sitting on my laptop looking worried. So, um, <laughs> questions? Sorry, I, I, I didn't include that. Some of you may saw there was a, a bug released out this week. So two point. Uh, oh sorry, um, the question was just asked about Marinette Collective, what's happening with that. Um, there was actually a, a bug release out this week, I think, two point something. Um, and there will be a feature release out, I think, in the next couple of months. Um, Ari is the best person to ask, though. But we are, um, you will continue to see a bunch of work on, the m on, on M Collective. Um, and some things that we're looking at really, t really for sort of future architecture of a Puppet um, is that we'll probably replace a lot of the Puppet co internal components with message queues, and that means that you'll see M, co M Collective sort of and Puppet sort of merge a little bit more. So it doesn't make sense doing a bunch of things we do now. Um, uh, for example, uh, compiling catalogs is a very, is a very um, uh, single-threaded sort of process, where realistically a better way of compiling catalogs would be create a bunch of message queues, uh, so message queue and create a bunch of uh, uh, catalog compilers and you can have that sort of a, a much more scalable sort of approach. Um, so you'll see a lot more work around M Collective and you'll see a bunch of integration between M Collective and Puppet. <coughs> wow, I wowed you all into silence either that or my English was so fast and so confusing you're all leaving there going, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> okay, danke, thank you very much. Um.